Cedric Diggory was, as you all know, exceptionally hardworking, infinitely fair-minded, and most importantly, a fierce, fierce friend. What if after everything that I've been through, something's gone wrong inside me? What if I'm becoming bad? So we've all got both light and dark inside of us. What matters is the part we choose to act on. That's who we really are. Plenty of courage, I see. Not a bad mind either. There's talent. Oh, yes, and a thirst to prove yourself. Oh, not Slytherin. Not me. Better be Gryffindor! The sorting of students at Hogwarts can be a very misleading event. The Gryffindors are known for their courage, the Hufflepuffs for their loyalty and justice, the Ravenclaws for their wisdom, and the Slytherins for their ambition. Now, the temptation here is to think that a Gryffindor can be a good Gryffindor, a courageous Gryffindor, without the other virtues, like justice or wisdom. In this episode, we're going to dive a bit deeper into the world of the virtues to find out exactly how they're related to one another. It also gives us a clue as to why Voldemort is a much better wizard than Harry is, and yet a far, far worse person. Before we move on to any new material, I want to review the six important characteristics of virtue that I mentioned in the last video. The first and most important characteristic about virtue is that it's an excellence of the soul, not of the body. The virtues give us an ability or a readiness to do good, a readiness to be all that you can be. The second characteristic of virtue is that it doesn't come and go easily. It's a stable disposition or quality of the soul. The third characteristic of virtue is that it's developed by making the right choices, virtuous choices, over and over and over and over and over again. Harry isn't courageous because he was born in October, and Voldemort isn't a homicidal maniac because he had black hair. The fourth characteristic of the virtues is that the moral virtues free us to live life to the fullest, to pursue what we think is good and important. In time, courage allows Slughorn to honor the memory of Lily Potter by helping Harry. The fifth characteristic of virtue is that it helps us choose a reasonable middle between two extremes. Without courage, we would have either too much fear and be cowards, or have too little fear and be rash. The sixth and final thing to remember about virtue is that it, unlike magic, can never be abused, because it's not an ability or a power itself. It's a good habit that perfects an ability that our souls already have. All right, now for some new stuff. Harry definitely has courage, but it takes a lot more than that to truly be a good person. Much more. Courage perfects us so that we don't have too much or too little fear. But being a good person means the whole person is good, and there's a lot more to that than simply not being a coward. Virtue is something that should perfect every part of us and every ability we have. And it's that completeness that so many people saw in Cedric Diggory. And we'll celebrate a boy who was kind and honest and brave and true right to the very end. The virtues are supposed to perfect our whole soul. So it makes sense that there would be one virtue that ties together the smaller intellectual virtues and makes them cooperate with one another. That virtue is wisdom, and it's something that Dumbledore himself personifies. Sure, the various professors have their specialties, but not only is he often better than them at their own subject, he possesses the wisdom, usually, to direct the operations of the entire school, along with the Order of the Phoenix. He understands better than anyone how Lord Voldemort thinks and how love is a force more powerful and fundamental than any magic. It isn't how you are not like. It's how you are not. You may not like him, Minister, but you can't deny Dumbledore's got style. Voldemort's lack of wisdom led to his first downfall when he first tried to kill Harry, who was protected by Lily's love. 
And this same lack of wisdom prompted Voldemort again to keep alive by drinking the blood of a unicorn. Drinking the blood of a unicorn will keep you alive even if you are an inch from death, but at a terrible price. You have slain something so pure that from the moment the blood touches your lips, you will have a half-life, a cursed life. Good will always triumph over evil, because evil is dumb. Just as wisdom unites the intellectual virtues, those virtues that help us know the truth, it's important for the moral virtues, courage, justice, temperance, to work together as well so that we can consistently make good decisions. One of the key connections between the moral virtues is the virtue of prudence, which is simply reason applied to our actions. Now, the moral virtues tell us what we want to do, but it's prudence that tells us how best to go about it. Wanting to save Ginny Weasley from a basilisk is a brave and just idea, but prudence says this probably is something that shouldn't be done alone. Lockhart may be useless, but he's going to try and get into the chamber. At least we can tell him what we know. Prudence unites the moral virtues by taking those good desires and developing a reasonable plan of action. The moral virtues are also united by the fact that all of them are needed to contribute to performing one good virtuous action. If any one of them fails, the whole action is going to suffer. When the virtues work together, good things, even great things, happen. He's going to sacrifice himself. No, you can't! Do you want to stop Slate from getting that stone or not? Knight to H3. This act is a combination of prudence and courage. Without courage, he would never have been willing to risk his life to save the stone. And without prudence, he would not have chosen this particular act, which works so spectacularly well. Checkmate. In Freeing Sirius Black, Harry is using a combination of justice and courage. He wants to free Sirius because he is innocent, and he does not deserve the Dementor's kiss. And he needs courage in order to take on the risk of that operation. Without temperance, Harry would not have had the patience he needed to carry out the rescue. And now we wait. And now we wait. But when the virtues don't work together, the results can be disastrous. We saw in the last video how Slughorn did not possess the courage to face the memory of passing information on to Tom Riddle. I know why you're here. Even though he recognized the justice of Harry's request. But I can't help you. When Harry is fooled by Voldemort into going to the Department of Mysteries to rescue Sirius, he shows great courage, too much in fact, because his courage is not complemented by prudence and temperance. He was told by Dumbledore that his occlumency lessons were vital to preventing Voldemort from gaining access to his mind. Oh, Severus, I'm afraid we can't wait. Not even till the morning. Otherwise, we'll all be vulnerable. Yet because of his curiosity, which is a type of intemperance, he wanted to have the dream about the door, to see what was behind it. Then, when it came time to rescue Sirius, he decided to go without the help of the Order of the Phoenix, and he decided not to listen to Hermione's doubts about the truthfulness of his vision. Harry, please just listen. What if Voldemort meant for you to see this? But the example par excellence of the necessity of all the moral virtues is Lord Voldemort himself. He seems brave because he refuses help in trying to kill Harry Potter. Do nothing. He willingly takes on Dumbledore in the Department of Mysteries. He seems temperate because he doesn't let pleasures of any sort distract him from his mission. He also seems to be prudent because he can weave elaborate plans to take over the world and avoid death through horcruxes. His schmoozing of Slughorn is recognized by Harry as a masterpiece of cunning manipulation. The only thing Lord Voldemort doesn't even appear to have is justice. He has no desire to give anyone what they're due. His apparent temperance and courage and prudence are not the result of a constant striving for the good life. Instead, they are a product of an insatiable desire for power, power that is not rightly his. Because Voldemort isn't just, his other virtues simply have the effect of making him very good at being very bad.
we've seen how the intellectual virtues and the moral virtues are each united in their own little groups, but we still haven't seen how they are supposed to work together and to help one another. The intellectual virtues help the moral virtues by judging what is true and false, good and evil, ugly and beautiful. The mind tells the heart what it should want. When Harry discovers that the murder of his parents was made possible by the betrayal of Sirius Black, he vows revenge because of his hatred. I hope he finds me. Because when he does, I'm going to be ready. When he does, I'm going to kill him. And yet, this is the same Harry Potter who prevents Sirius and Lupin from killing Peter Pettigrew, the true traitor. It was a noble thing you did back there. He doesn't deserve it. Well, I just didn't think my dad would have wanted his two best friends to become killers. Besides, dead, the truth dies with him. Alive, you're free. The thought of his father helps him see clearly that handing over Wormtail to the proper authorities is certainly much more just than finishing him off personally. Once he understood something as unjust, he chose differently. Another connection between the moral and intellectual virtues is prudence. The moral virtues move us to choose what is good, but it's prudence that tells us how to get there in the best possible way. And prudence is not a moral, but an intellectual virtue. It was often the Dark Lord's pleasure to invade the minds of his victims, creating visions designed to torture them into madness. Only after extracting the last exquisite ants of agony. Only when he had them literally begging for death would he finally kill them. Ooh, that sounds pretty bad. It would be really nice if there were some sort of defense against that. The power of our clemency will help shield you from access or influence. Huh, well, that's a relief. The virtues are also united by the fact that the will can tell the intellect to think about something, to ponder the meaning of some mystery, until the truth emerges. The virtuous person is someone whose whole being is directed towards what he rightly understands to be good and true. In order to get there, I want to offer two pieces of advice based on what I've said so far. The first is that, since all moral virtues are connected, picking one in particular to focus on and work on is going to have the effect of causing all the others to grow as well. If we want to be courageous, well then we want our courage to be perfect. And it's not going to be perfect if it isn't also temperate and just and prudent as well. So focusing on one virtue doesn't mean neglecting all the other virtues as well. The second piece of advice I want to give is that to grow in any of the virtues, we can't consciously reject one of them. Focusing on courage is fine, but telling yourself, I'm not going to try and practice temperance right now, that seems kind of tough. I'll save that one for later. That's not going to work. Again, because all of the virtues are united to one another. Torpedo one, and they all start sinking. Now we finally come to the end of a second video on virtue and living a moral life. Notice anything missing? Like Jesus? What we've covered so far has been all about natural virtue, virtues based on reason. And as good as that is, that's not enough. A life of natural virtue, a reasonable life, cannot fulfill the deepest desires of our hearts. It cannot satiate our need for love. It cannot tell us why we're here and why good people suffer. And it does not have the power to conquer death, either the death of those we love or our own. What we need is the love of God, a love revealed in the passion, death, and resurrection of his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. In the next video, we'll reflect on God's saving work and its relationship to the Harry Potter series. To paraphrase the ancient Christian theologian Tertullian, what does Hogwarts have to do with Jerusalem? Please visit preachingfriars.org. Thank you for watching, and remember to read lots, pray more, and keep the faith.